This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Uh, welcome to uh, Session uh, 5B uh, of, the, um, uh, of this, uh, this exercise. Uh, and I want to spend uh, the next hour chatting to you about the simulation that you did in session three. Uh, remember what we did there, and uh, many of you uh, experienced this firsthand, and that uh, session has been videotaped. Uh, it's important because we left uh, that session uh, somewhat. Uh, I guess full of ideas, full of uh, uh, various incentives and various uh, aspects of that simulation. Uh, but it would be remiss if we didn't tease out some important practical messages from that simulation. Uh, just to refresh your memories, the framework that we were working around was what we called in the lectures and on the slides time-based management and we discussed this as a preamble to the simulation of time-based management and I won't go into this model in detail because we've already covered it but you remember this was the model where we were talking about a current state this is where we are now in many organisations this is where we have a whole set of non-value adding and value adding activities. And if we measure as a percentage of lead time, the time consumed in value adding versus the time in non-value adding, it is not unusual to find something like 5% value adding only during the total lead time. Which then says, well, what, what are we going to do about that? And the temptation is to say, well, of course we're value adding, so let's find ways to address and reduce the time that's value adding, faster, quicker, bigger, more sophisticated technology, and maybe we could reduce that to 2.5%. But the non value adding doesn't normally. Result. In fact, arithmetically, it doesn't. Reduce this, forget about the rest of the non value adding, and this is what we define in our preamble to the simulation the technology trap. In the simulation, we didn't do this. We looked at and discovered that uh, the value adding is a relatively small percentage. But in the model that we're dealing under, what we need to try and do is address uh, these wastes or non-value adding activities to the point where they're roughly equal, 50-50. That's where we want to get to. A long journey, but the benefits are profound. And this is the desired future state, and arguably, this is a world-class performance. Processes, lead time, wastes and so on, as we discussed, discussed in the, uh, as I said, in the preamble to the session. And that led, then led us to appreciate, as we were discussing in this preamble, what are these non-value addings? This is the TBM model, time-based management model. And the way to get to this desired state is to reduce the non-value adding activities. Non-value adding is another way of saying wastes. Wastes. Negatives. Aspects of the organisation that we try to get rid of. And there's an acronym, a long one, that we can use to help us remember what these wastes look like or what are they defined as. These are uh, 
this is the acronym, is Timwood. Uh, you remember it was Timwood? When I had some students in a previous class say, oh, I've heard about Timwood. And I said, what did you say? And he said, yeah, oh, it's Timwood. It's all very important, Timwood. So you, you, mean, you mean teamwork? Teamwork, people working together in teams. No, 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 he said, Timwood. Timwood, and it was just a, a quaint little dialogue and interaction between two of us in the class. And what he was saying is Timwood. I thought he said it was Timwood. Timwood. <laughs> anyway, these are a way of remembering what is called the seven deadly wastes. These are, in fact, quite a lot of the sort of white space that we talked about in our session of structures and measurement, deadly wastes. Remember the seven deadly wastes. Transportation, transport. I stands for inventory. We define that in our session and, and saw inventory build up during the simulation. In is motion. Motion is a waste. Motion movement is a waste, something that we need to understand. W stands for waiting. Material moving through a process that isn't moving is waiting and waiting is a waste. Why is it sitting there? What can we do about it? O stands for overproduction. We saw that in the simulation where we had, we were all very busy, all very busy adding value as we thought, but we were actually making more than the customer required. And we were building up this inventory at the end of the production line. <laughs> the other O stands for over-processing, over-processing, which means <coughs> really a product is too complicated, how can it be simplified to eliminate that complexity? And the final word in this Timwood concept is defects. Making defects, clearly, um, is, is a waste. <coughs> Excuse me. And in this um, simulation, we demonstrated very practically how these wastes contribute to low lead time, poor customer service, and how um, collectively these replicate, uh, if we can address these, opportunities to make significant improvements to the organisational performance. Now, there's a couple of questions, there's a couple of concepts that maybe are exercising your mind and saying, I'm still a little confused, I still didn't quite understand what was happening in that simulation. So let me just make a few interesting hopefully interesting observations about the simulation and the things we can learn from it to take away to other uh, organisations and other processes. Firstly, we structured the simulation as if we were all working in silos. Each operator had a job to do, a department, and they were producing to the maximum of their ability good product, or so they thought, in the right quantity, or so they thought, at the right rate, or so they thought, but in fact the results were disastrous. So, we experienced vertical, a vertical silo uh, operation. And as we have said, a way forward is to transfer that to more of a process centered or horizontal organization. 
In other words, how can we connect the individual operators so that they feel part of a unified team working towards delivering products and services in the right fashion. And the way we can begin to make this transition and achieve these benefits is to look at how we are going to measure the operations. And there are two key measures that we can use to make this transformation. If I can just harken for a moment back to our drawing of the silo uh, functionally based organisation, you may recall vertical, when we develop an argument to be able to think more about converting to horizontal and our process runs deep in the organisation Remember, site, pop, process, output, customer. How can we transfer this? How can we make a step towards moving to a better type organisation? Well, one way is through considering the measures. And there are two measures that we can use to begin to make this, this transition. The one is lead time. as we defined last week, the time it takes for this material to move this way, the lead time, and it's a useful and powerful measure because everybody in the organisation at the operational level contributes to either good, bad or indifferent lead times because they're all undertaking activities that contribute to it. And the second dimension is customer service. And those two measures alone begin to create a new mindset around what's important. Why? Because we all own the customer. What we are doing here ultimately manifests itself in customer satisfaction, customer delight or customer horror, <laughs> whatever. And so uh, here we have some ideas around the benefits of this uh, vertical and and the transformation to a more horizontal structure. Uh, a couple of other messages. Uh, remember our definition of the operational strategy and a way to tackle this problem, this dilemma that we are confronted with and we're confronted with in, a, in improving uh, the current state in the simulation was to think about those words, remember, Continuous improvement. Continuous improvement. Constantly searching for new and innovative ways to continuously improve, to reduce the lead time to improve customer service. And how do we continuously improve? You will remember through the progressive identification and elimination of non-value adding or non-service adding activities. Remember that definition. Non-value adding wastes elimination. I.e. the waste that we see up here, the non-value adding activities. And we're going to do that through creativity and ideas generation from our people. And I think you would agree, having observed and experienced this simulation, many of you are hopefully brimming with suggestions of, gee, what if you did this, how could you do this? Then it's a great way to tackle this. Tapping into that idea, those ideas. Now, on that point of uh, continuous improvement, of course, uh, we, we also need to appreciate that sometimes you know, this is the this is the first time. It's fine. I just need to stop. Oh, it's okay. It's I can okay. hear you anyway. Is that okay? Yeah. Right. Okay. That's why it's usually okay. <laughs> right, we'll I'm locking. Locking. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Back to this. 
Uh, and we had in the uh, continuous improvement space the interesting idea of a, a sort of a learning curve that yes, uh, re recognize that when you do something for the first time, uh, you, you, you practice it a second time and a third time and a fourth time and things begin to get standardized and we can then set those in place in our standard operating procedures. It's simply a way of looking at this curve. This is the number of times that you do something. And this is the, for example, the time it takes to do it. So the first time, number one, takes a long time because you've never done it before. You've not practiced and you're experimenting and thinking about it. And it's not until a rule of thumb that you've done something about seven to eight times, like this simulation, that you begin to flatten the curve out. And this becomes stable. So the more you do it, the more regular it gets, the more this remains consistent and the more standardised it becomes, which is good news. All this stuff is effectively learning and arguably that in itself is at this waste. Now, other concepts. <clears throat> One of the things we did uh, you may recall, was we generated some defects. Not many of you picked that up until it was too late. And so, um, what we're going to have to try and do is find ways to eliminate and reduce those defects, which are a substantial waste. And which leads us to another important bullet point. There's a bullet point here. Quality at the source. Quality at the source. In other words, <clears throat> unlike, or, or as in your simulation, we produced defects that were not discovered until it was too late. They were found at the end of the production line. Uh, the question is how can we build quality in to the operators, to the process, to ensure that we identify these defects before they are completed. So each operator, each department is responsible for finding uh, the sources of defects and stopping the source of the defect before we continue to make that product through the whole, uh, through the whole production cycle. Quality of the source. And uh, I can give you a simple example of this. I, I know Hewlett Packard in, in the States, uh, who were making, uh, making computers, uh, identified a whole raft of problems that they were having in terms of defects that were coming out of the end of the assembly line. And there was something like, as I recall, about 160 problems they identified. And they tackled this issue by stopping production. They didn't make anything. Two, uh, because when they found one of these issues, they stopped the, prob stopped the process and fixed the problem so that it never came back. So effectively, over time, they eliminated the bulk of these defects and sources of defects that were haunting the production capability of Hewlett-Packard for years. So quality at the source, pushing the responsibility and location of defects back as early as possible up the production line. Another track, another lesson to learn is the notion about machine utilisation. You in the simulation were driven by Mr. I am perfect to drive your processes, your separate machines, as fast as you could because my rationale for that was to say, you know, if you're not making something, the machine's not being used, then you are not making money. I'm not able to pay for the machine. So machine utilisation uh, can be a, a, a major problem if we're driven to think that maximising the utilisation of our machines generates profitability if all we are doing is generating 
finished goods inventory that the customer doesn't want, or we have to build a warehouse to put it in, or we have to consume, uh, we have to install a computer tracking system, or whatever, it is in turn a waste. So making too much overproduction is a waste. And how can we synchronize and tune the production rate to be in line and consistent with whatever our customers want is the challenge. So there's that dimension about overproduction. And there's also another lesson. And I can share it this, this way. Let's imagine that I have a bucket here in which I'm going to look at how our machines are being utilised. I have a, a big machine here and I want to make sure everything's operating. And this is epitomised by uh, an experience I had at the Geelong Rod Mill making reinforcing rods. And the big machines, quite expensive, uh, to purchase and to maintain and operate uh, when, uh, when you looked at that the machine actually wasn't operating a lot of the time machine utilisation issue it wasn't operating in fact two or three times when I noticed it on three or four different occasions the machine wasn't making anything and it, it sort of led me to wonder what, what could be happening here and so when I spoke to some of the people there, I said, yeah, that's pretty normal for this machine because we have to, if this is 100%, i.e. the machine's making good product 100% of the time, we have to take off some of that time to maintain the machine. You know, it's a machine that work, gets worn or there's parts have to be serviced and maintained so we can't make product during that period of time. So we have to take a bit of that 100% away. Because this is one machine making multiple products, it takes a little bit of time to change, in fact it takes a lot of time to change this machine from product A to product B. It might be a different diameter reinforcing rod. It may be a, a made from a different material with a different tensile strength and so on. So we have to take a bit of time off of this. Sometimes we find that there's no material at the start of the machine, at the front of the process, because we hadn't got it there in time or it was not available, hadn't been purchased or whatever, and we have to take a bit of time off here. And then maybe also there's no labour, no manpower, person power available because they're off doing other things. So the psyche, the uh, management uh, approach was these are a given and there's not a lot we can do about that. So we have to take away an allowance for this to happen. And it actually reduced this down to about 60% available. So it wasn't 100% of up, it was only 60. And that's an interesting equation, because when you speak to people, they say, you know, you say, what's the utilisation? And everyone says, well, it's, it's 80, 90%. Yeah, we're making a lot of product, getting good. But what they're actually saying is because these are given, I'm getting 80% of what's left, 80% of 60%, which is 48%. So machine utilisation is the available time is actually 48, not 90 or 80 percent with that mindset. Now, so what? These activities are wastes, all four, and there are others, but at this stage, for our argument, is four. Machine maintenance and breaking down um, is a waste, as we experienced. Changing over, why does it take so long to change machines from one product to the next? We'll come to that in a moment. Material and labour was ordering or planning or sequencing laying out the factory. So machine utilisation is, is a, 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 a fascinating trap that often uh, results either in making too much or just a, a, a mindset that says it's not available anyway not available, when in fact, I'll put that in inverted commas, because if we got rid of these, 
waste, the availability does increase. The track goes beyond that because, you know, someone say, gee, you know, uh, we can't uh, seem to get enough product out of this machine, we can't make enough, we're only getting half, so we better spend another million dollars buying another machine to reach higher production levels. Arguably, that's wasted money, and it's another machine that we didn't need. It's overproduction and a major problem. maintenance of machines and equipment and technology. That is, it's part of the necessity for a good, clean, lean operating facility to maintain the machines. So we have to make sure that there's a schedule and the machines are, uh, are, are maintained appropriately. In our simulation, we experienced a machine breakdown. One of the machines broke and the results were pretty serious. How could, we prevent, how could we overcome that? Well, we could embark on a preventative maintenance program. We could perhaps schedule maintenance while we're not making product, and that's possible. In other words, we don't wait for it to break down, but we say, let's do the maintenance on the machine uh, overnight or at a different shift or whatever. But interestingly, the word preventative is now becoming uh, more... Uh, more relevant and more exciting by changing the preventative concept to productive maintenance, total productive maintenance. Now, you can get a feel for the swing here. This is a bit negative. This is trying to stop something from happening. This is a bit more positive. It's saying we can actually learn from mistakes. And productive, if we adopt that mindset, uh, People who are passionate about this topic, and it's a very fertile area for us as engineers, because it's machines, technology, engineering, measurement, is how can we prevent machines from breaking down? How can we, in fact, believe that machines, like wine, should get better with age? Can a machine get better with age? Hmm. Well, it can if we now understand the use of uh, strain gauges on the machines. Uh, the synchrotron here in uh, Melbourne is doing some exciting work about identifying failure in critical parts on machines long before they collapse or break catastrophically. Predictive, saying this machine is getting sick. You better start fixing it. You better start stopping it and doing something about it as soon as possible. So the notion of predictive and productive maintenance uh, becomes a, a great lesson, uh, particularly from um, our, our simulation. The other uh, important message, and this is a little more uh, convoluted, but one that uh, I want is critical, and you experience this in the, in the simulation, of batch size, batch size and change over time. Now hang in there with this complicated but critical and a significant opportunity. In the simulation we had a batch size of eight. It was scheduled that way, eight red, eight yellow, eight green. That was how it was scheduled. That's is how we identified through a, a concept called economic order quantity. It says there's a trade-off between the costs to make 
smaller batches, less items, versus the cost of uh, storing those, economic or economy. And that's how the batch size was determined. And a critical reason how that batch, uh, that batch size is determined is very dependent on the change over time in our machines. In other words, uh, to put it into the real context, we have, a, let's say, a big uh, metal stamping press. That press, uh, it has to be capable of making uh, front panels for a Toyota uh, Corolla, and also it has to be capable of making the uh, wheel arches or the chassis or the doors for uh, a, a, a Toyota Camry or something. It's because we can't often dedicate one machine to make the multiple products because the market doesn't want that. We want one uh, or fewer uh, per, per run. So does it follow, and I hope it does, that if it takes a long time to change over the machine from product A to product B, then it's intuitive to say, if we are forever changing the machine, then we're never gonna make anything. So once we've set up the machine to make a certain product, we want to keep making the same product. Surely it's cheaper to make it that way. But as we experienced in the simulation, the batch size was high and the results were amazing. All negative, the batch size produced a lot of work in process inventory, it produced huge amounts of finished goods inventory, it created complexity, uh, dissatisfaction, and is one of the most important evils in our model of Timwood, the inventory wastes. How can we reduce those wastes? So, we cannot accept and should not ever accept that the time it takes to change from product A to B cannot be changed. Um, and think of the consequences if we could reduce the change over time. What that means now is that I can make a greater variety of product, yeah, and I can make a smaller batch of product, and if I can make a smaller batch, it's going to go through the process a lot quicker, and the lead time will be reduced substantially. So there are natural benefits that come from identifying why change over times are so long. And it's a, just a, a marvellous example of a simple engineering type time and motion study. We were doing some work uh, in Adelaide at Mitsubishi a few years ago and we had a huge big 200 ton stamping machine. Gigantic thing. Cost them a lot of money. And we uh, were exploring ways to reduce that change over time so we simply videotaped what happened like you're videotape, videotaping me. We stood up that video camera and we simply put it on the machine and said, righto, we've stopped making product A, now we need to change this big machine over to start making product B. We videotaped it. And we showed the video back to the operators who were responsible for changing the machine over. And without going into the detail, there was a lot of blank space. There was a lot of nothing happened during the changeover time. It, why then, you know, how come it took two and a half hours and sometimes eight hours to change this big machine over? Well, it was very simple. Uh, one of the things, one of the contributors was the operator needed to get the right spanner, shifter, a bit of equipment to undo bolts on the machine to change the die, the die being the bits of metal that shape whatever. So that operator would wander off and go to the machine tool room and either got the wrong spanner or engaged in a long debate or it was miles down the corridor 
And when they came back, it was still the wrong spanner, so off they go back to change it again. By the time they got back, there was literally 30 minutes lost in production time and changeover time. It, was, it contributed to the long changeover time. Um, so uh, how could that be eliminated? Well, it's pretty simple. You just make sure that the, what is equipment is required sits right next to the machine. So we eliminate that motion transport and all the other things that happen in trying to get this die to be changed from product A to product B. Very uh, simple ideas. Uh, maybe we could install quick uh, hydraulic clamps. Uh, maybe we could have to uh, uncouple the dies. Uh, maybe we can have the next die sitting right next door, ready to be put in the machine, quick clamps, hydraulic pneumatic, uh, all that is, 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 is fascinating and uh, really interesting. Why are bolts so long with a nut on them when it takes us the nuts and the bolts could be smaller or a quarter of the size. All of these are just lots and lots and lots of little ideas that can help us to dramatically reduce the changeover time. Why do we do that? As I said, we reduce the change over time to reduce the batch size, to decrease the lead time, and to provide more flexibility to meet variety in the marketplace. And in the, uh, in our, uh, in the Toyota production system, uh, an article is on LMS on the session five, uh, there is a concept, uh, I'm sorry about all these, <laughs> acronyms, but that's how I remember them, uh, a single minute exchange of dies. It's a Japanese concept and it in part contributes to the miracle that Japan has experienced in the manufacturing sector. A single minute exchange of dies. Which is simply a way of saying we are aiming in Toyota to reduce the changeover times to single minute. <coughs> By single minute, it's, down, it's less than 10 minutes, not less than a minute, less than 10 minutes. Every machine, every process, reducing that changeover time through adopting a mentality around, um, around SMED. Now, there's some, I think, of the lessons. That's, that's a critical one, that batch size changeover time. And in fact, <coughs> many people use this now this is, I admit, fairly uh, complicated and tedious. Some people uh, to try and communicate this message to frontline operators. Uh, I've seen these little pictures drawn right down deep on the organisation in which a, people, a senior management will say something like, you know, in our organisation, in our process, we have um, inventory and we need to find ways to eliminate that as a waste. Here is a, um, a very simple message that some organisations have found uh, effective in communicating this whole story about inventory, waste and, uh, and time-based management to uh, frontline operators. And it says uh, something like this, that imagine our company, our organisation, is like a boat sailing over a lake free to sail anywhere and under the, under the water are rocks and because we have built a lot of inventory in particular the work in process inventory which is the inventory that sits inside our process so we have lots of this so we can sail freely unencumbered because all of our problems are hidden. So what we are going to do is to drain the swamp. Sorry, there's a very bad Americanism there. To drain the swamp, but we're going to deliberately reduce the inventory to see what happens. And so they set about reducing the inventory. Interestingly, sometimes the inventory is reduced and the boat can still sail freely over the pond. Nothing happens, so <laughs> that's a benefit. But we progressively reduce this inventory level until we start to identify rocks, problems. 
So we start to address those problems. It might be defects, quality, and we progressively reduce that until the next problem is identified. It might be change over time, as we've just discussed. So we have to reduce that progressively. The next one might be a machine breakdown. So we start working at ways to mitigate machine breakdown. So we're embarking on a plan of continuous improvement, continuous reduction of waste, i.e. inventory, draining the level of water in the pond to deliberately find the rocks to eliminate them so we can continue to remove the rocks so we can continue to sail happily over the water. And that's, I think, a simple message that helps us to better understand all of these wastes and how they contribute to long lead times. And the final uh, point, bullet point, we've got a lot of them here, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's probably more, is this important notion of converting our production our, in, a, in, a, uh, in its manufacturing plant from trying to push material through. In our simulation, we were pushing material. We scheduled this operator at number one and we were pushing batches through the simulation, hoping that we'd get to the customer in the right way. There's another alternative, another one, and it's a little bit different, but pushing is essentially here, pushing from one machine, one operator to the next, to what we call pool production. So instead of scheduling this way, and the customer's down here, we pull. So the customer purchase an item, that is a signal for operator four to pull material from operator three and add value. Operator three pulls from operator two and adds value. Operator two pulls from operator one and adds value. And operator one pulls from the raw material store. An important and powerful message because then we're going to be in connectivity with our customer and we're going to be streamlining how material flows through the line. <coughs> and that in itself can make a major contribution to reducing the lead time. It's a bit like a sort of fishing exercise. Throw your hook in, wind it in, throw your hook in, wind it in, etc. From the customer to the raw materials, not from the raw materials to the customer. Difficult concept, but very powerful, and one that at least we need to be aware of because you can find particularly examples in Toyota, etc., of push versus pull production. Okay, so there's some hopefully some some valuable takeaways from this whole exercise around um, around time-based management, and in particular. Uh, the excellent work you've done in this uh, in this simulation. Uh, this sets the groundwork for you in part B of your assignment, which is specifically on time-based management. And you can choose either to select an organisation of your liking to produce your consultant's report, or you can choose the perfect label company to. Uh, uh, to structure and prepare your assignment report for part B. And before we finish, before we at the end of this detail, let's recap and let's just understand an important reason for doing all this. What then are the business benefits? Why bother? The business benefits of reducing process lead time. reducing lead times. And these benefits are significant and apply to most 
production, engineering type um, and service processes. Remember, time-based management, lead time, the lead time is the time it takes for this material to flow through the process to emerge at the other end to your customer. Why would we want to do this? A lot of our business benefit. Well, let's just uh, think of, about all those uh, in, uh, as, in our next uh, 10 or 15 minutes. The first one is, is very uh, obvious. If something is not adding value, what is it adding? What, is, what does it do? What, if it's not adding value and, it, and is a waste, our costs come down if they can be eliminated. All the complexity, all the wastes add cost so we can reduce our production cost accordingly. Cost down. Can you survive? Can you operate with high quality levels? Does Poor quality contribute to long lead time. Does poor quality, and of course it does, because if we have defects in our process that we're not identifying and eliminating, then we either have to make them again, so the lead time increases, or we have to throw them out and start again, lead time increases. Uh, so whether we find uh, when we uh, have these defects, particularly at the end of the production line, the quality uh, is, is poor. If we shrink the lead time, we flush out the quality issues so quality is improved. Starting to get some good benefits here, aren't we? Cost down, quality up. Doesn't that make sense? The next benefit is customer service. In other words, if our lead time is short, we can begin to think around if the customer wants something today, later today, we start making it this morning. How's that for a challenge? Can we get our production rates much better aligned to the customer so the customer is delighted, they get a good cost, low cost, high quality, and they get it when they want? And isn't it all about ultimately the customer as an important characteristic? So now that we're linked to the customer, we'd expect our customer service to go up. Well. There's a couple of other important, not uh, a couple, there's many benefits. Forecasting accuracy. What does that mean? Well, <coughs> very simply, organisations engineering organisations, production organisations, have to try and forecast into the future to arrange for the um, <coughs> appropriate raw materials, resources, and uh, uh, labour force, etc., to be in place to cope with that. So they try and predict into the future. And if this is accuracy, I've got here the ac accu accuracy of looking into the future, and this is right now, today, and this is into the future, it follows that if we're dealing in real time today, we can be 100% accurate. But it is a rule of thumb, and a valid rule of thumb, that over time, the accuracy drops off. The further you are trying to predict into the future, the less accurate you become. That's a fact. That's a rule of thumb, and it's very unusual to find any organisation that can predict 100% way into the future. So, what we uh, traditionally try and do with this problem is to increase this accuracy of this data, and we're going to try and do some data analysis. We're going to maybe buy a software package that looks at historical data, analyzes the past, 
in an effort to increase the accuracy and we bring in highly paid consultants etc etc to help do this and yes we might increase the forecast and the accuracy it's interesting that if you then were to look typically three months into the future again a rule of thumb the forecasting accuracy is typically around 70 percent accurate okay that's based on experience and a fair bit of empirical data. Three months. So option one is to massage the data. Option two is to reduce the lead time of our processes. By reducing the lead time, look what happens to the forecasting accuracy. 90%. 95%. The closer we get to real time, the more accurate we are. So, not a bad idea. Reducing lead time increases forecasting accuracy. And that's a, a lovely benefit to have. There's some other benefits of reducing lead time. As we've discussed already, our flexibility increases. That is, we can quickly change from one product to the next. We can be much more flexible in our product mix and how we deliver uh, product and service to our customers. And that's exactly what our customers want. They want choice, they want variety, and the ability to be flexible is a key benefit. Cash flow improvement. What do we mean by cash flow? Let's, let's try and simply, cash flow is basically how quickly do you get your money back from the money you've spent? How quickly are you getting that back? <clears throat> if the lead time is long, input, output, long lead time, I spend money here, don't I? Because I have to buy stuff and I have to pay for it. So I'm giving money away here and I get my money back when my customer purchases something and gives me the money arising in the bank account. So from the time it takes from here to here, my cash flow cycle is essentially that line wrapped up in a circle. And this is poor cash flow. In other words, it takes a long time for me to get my money back from when I've spent it. If I dramatically reduce my lead time by using time-based management, I'm now at a point where I wrap that curve up and my cash flow cycle is a lot quicker. Question for you is which one would you rather have? What would you rather have? Very quick turnover of your money or very long? And the answer is, I think, fairly obvious. You would, I think, much prefer to have improved cash flow. So that's a very powerful benefit. And there is a less uh, obvious but important uh, benefit, a business benefit, from reducing the lead time in our time-based manual approach. And that is employee morale improves. If the organisation is riddled with waste and has long lead times, people get very uh, low and poor in morale. You know, like uh, you arrive home at, uh, at the end of the day and you're partner or, or whatever, your child says, what sort of a day did you have at the office? Then you say, well, I, yeah, it was a pretty typical day. I, uh, I had a lot of uh, problems uh, with making things and a machine broke down and someone wasn't there that we depended on 
it, it, it was uh, a pretty messy sort of day. Uh, I made a few defects and the boss growled at me. Um, yeah, it was a pretty average day. And so, yeah, that's sort of what I did. The implication there is, you know, we have to assume that people come to work because they like to be adding value, not to generating waste. So if we've eliminated the waste, and people think, actually, I had a good day. I made a lot, it was good, it was enjoyable, I had satisfaction that uh, my work was being uh, readily uh, accepted by the customer and my boss acknowledged me. Yeah, it's a good place to work and I'm happy to come to work, so my morale improves and I'm happy to make a few contributions to identify further opportunities for waste elimination. So, <clears throat> this is some uh, classic ideas on how we can reduce uh, uh, lead time at rate seven or eight points. And wow, what a wonderful set of benefits. So instead of having to think about cost and quality and all these business things, the one thing to do is to understand lead time, declare war on wastes, and find ways to reduce the lead time. And if you reduce the lead time, you'll get these business benefits. It's a bit like lead and lag. A bit like the balance scorecard message. This is the lead indicator. This is the lag indicator. Great thing, this is input, this is output. Lead time, input, output, all these business benefits. And that is precisely the strategy and the model that has been used by many organisations to revolutionise their business and to become world class and internationally competitive. It is the essence of, for example, the GE turnaround. We mentioned that earlier. Larry Bossidy, a book uh, about uh, improving performance in the white space. The second part of Jack Welch's strategy was to reduce your lead times by 50%. And I quote this simply as an example of a practical example of this model. He launched a program called P50. And he said, I don't really care if you're making locomotives or light bulbs or electronic componentry. I want you to reduce your lead times by 50% over the next two years. Pretty ambitious. Uh, and what I'm going to do is introduced to you a training program which was launched as, as T50 uh, and it, it galvanised everyone. How do you bring a common message to such a diverse and disparate and huge organisation? Jack Welch had discovered this mystery and felt, gee, uh, I don't need to bother people with this, just worry about your lead time reduction and I'll get these back. And he introduced a program at a university actually called Crotonville, where his management was sent away to be trained in these concepts. Uh, it, it was a, a, an operation called Operation Workout, where managers were, were required to spend about a week in intensive training. It's called Workout because it was about working out yourself. No ego. Jack Walsh was conversely quite egotistical. <laughs> Work out your muscle, because you've got to be fit, active, energy, energised, and work out waste. So here is an example. GE, the turnaround, and if Jack Welsh had not had that wisdom, had that ability to see this connectivity, GE would be probably not surviving in this day and age. He was the turnaround king, and he made dramatic improvements. And there are many, many, many other examples that we can call on. Uh, we can't go into those in any detail. That's not the purpose of this subject and this uh, subject matter. So <clears throat> I hope uh, you found this uh, message uh, compelling, uh, relevant to the real world. And I think it, it, it gives you a much better handle on the material and the important uh, business benefits we can get from uh, this time-based uh, management model. So, uh, hopefully this is a good secret for you because, you know, uh, as we discovered, 
earlier, this, this idea is still got a long way to go in terms of its um, impact uh, and a lot of people will still get lost in the busyness here. They still get lost in trying to do this bit by bit. Uh, this is the umbrella overarching big picture, lead time reduction. So that takes us to the end of this particular session uh, and I think uh, you've got a lot of ammunition there to play with and uh, think about the simulation, the video, the business benefits and these ideas uh, and if you have any questions of course please uh, drop me a note, an email and uh, more than happy to engage you in a discussion. Not too many uh, but uh, uh, if, it's, uh, if you feel a little uncertain about all this then please drop me an email and, uh, on a syndicate basis and we will uh, get back to you uh, as soon as possible. So thank you for your attendance and um, we'll, uh, uh, we'll look forward to catching up in the future in some way, shape or form. Thank you.